Hello, I'm Dr. Sally Shaywitz, the Audrey G. Ratner Professor in Learning Development at Yale University. And I'd like to welcome each of you to this talk on the Shaywitz Dyslexia Screen. And I want to tell you a little bit about dyslexia and also about what we know and what would be very helpful to do. Dyslexia was first reported a long time ago, in 1896, by a British physician. His name was W. Pringle Morgan, and he reported this in the British Medical Journal on November 7, 1896. He called it a case of congenital word blindness. And the student he talked about Percy F., as he described, a well-grown lad, age 14. He has always been a bright and intelligent boy, quick at games, and in no way inferior to others of his age. His great difficulty has been, and is now, his inability to learn to read. And Dr. Morgan goes on to say, if it weren't for that, Percy would be the brightest in the class. So that fits the children we continue to see today in the 21st century and aligns with the, the, uh, the cutting-edge definition of dyslexia that can be found in the United States Senate Resolution 284 that was just passed October 4th 2017. It's bipartisan, sponsored by Senators Cassidy, Warren, Murphy, Graham, and others. And it was passed unanimously. And what it says, this is the definition of dyslexia, an unexpected difficulty in reading for an individual who has the intelligence to be a much better reader. And we now also have experimental evidence to show why this is an unexpected difficulty. In a study that we carried out with colleagues and published in 2010, we compared IQ and reading in typical readers over time. And what we found in typical readers was that IQ, intelligence, and reading were dynamically linked. They affected each other, and they traveled together. And that really coincides with what so many people think. You know, if you're very smart, you'll be a really good reader, for example. And then we did something in addition. We not only looked at typical or non-impaired readers, we looked at dyslexic readers. And we wanted to see what was the relationship of IQ and reading, and what we found confirms what Dr. Morgan noticed and wrote about Percy F. over 100 years ago, that in dyslexic readers, IQ and reading diverge. As you can see here on the top line, as a dyslexic individual, you can have a very high IQ, but a much lower level of reading. So. It's an unexpected difficulty in reading. So what is the prevalence of dyslexia? Well, it often depends on who you ask. Reflecting the failure of schools to identify dyslexia in their students, there's a vast difference in the prevalence rates of dyslexia reported by schools, Oh, we don't have any kids like that. Oh, maybe we have a few, a few percent. And reported in research studies in which every student has been assessed with dyslexia. Wow. In a study like that, we find approximately one in five students, one in five, is dyslexic. And this teaches us something very, very important. To be counted, you first must be identified. If you're not identified, you can't be counted. 
So to summarize the prevalence, dyslexia is highly prevalent. It affects one in five, and it is the most common learning disability, affecting 80 to 90 percent of all individuals who are thought to have a learning disability. And here you can see this best on this uh, figure. You could see this is learning disabilities. And look at the yellow. 80 to 90 percent of all learning disabilities is covered by dyslexia. So 80 to 90 percent of the students identified as learning disabled are dyslexic. I wrote a book called Overcoming Dyslexia, uh, published by Knopf, and of course I wrote it in English, an alphabetic language. Well, uh, and it's been translated into quite a number of other alphabetic languages. But you can imagine my surprise when I found that my book, Overcoming Dyslexia, has been translated into um, two different um, uh, uh, languages in Chinese, uh, Japanese, and Korean, all logographic languages. And here you can see um, me standing by and uh, surrounded by a group of wonderful children, parents, and teachers in Japan. So this shows that dyslexia is universal. It occurs in every language. So what is dyslexia? What is the origin of the difficulties? The origin of the difficulties in dyslexia is getting to the sounds of spoken language. As a result of this, children who are dyslexic have difficulties with spoken language, most often retrieving a word that they want to say. Within their brain, they know it, they have the concept, but to get it out, to utter the word, is a struggle. In reading, so in order to read, you have to learn your letters and how letters uh, link to sounds. And this is very, very difficult for dyslexic readers. Dyslexic, and that's problems in decoding. Conversely, dyslexic individuals have problems in taking the spoken word and transforming it into the written word, spelling it. And finally, people who are dyslexic, who have had difficulty accessing the spoken language system in their primary language, often have incredible difficulties in learning a second or foreign language. We and others have studied dyslexia especially the neural systems in dyslexia, using a wonderful technology called Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging, or fMRI. And here you could see um, one of our subjects in one of our studies, Casey. She's laying in a scanner, and it's very similar to the uh, imager if you've had a headache or a problem with your neck or other part of your body, and if you've had an MRI. The difference is this is a functional MRI. So you can see right above Casey's head, there are like three little windows. And that's a prism that she's going to look through. Um, and in her hands is a button box. And we're going to show her different stimuli and ask her, do these rhyme? And she'll press one if it's yes, and the other if it's no. And here's Casey after the imaging procedure, none the worse for wear. And so what do we know about the neural systems for reading? On the left, you can see an individual, and we're looking at the left side of the brain. The front of the brain is called anterior. The back is called posterior. And here you can see the various systems in the brain. Right in front are the frontal lobes anteriorly. Right behind that, in pink, are the parietal lobes. 
and you're only seeing one lobe because you're seeing just the left side, and below the parietal lobe in yellow is the temporal lobe, and right behind that in blue is the occipital lobe. So those are the lobes of the brain. And what we and other scientists have found it, when in reading, there are three systems involved, primarily on the left side of the brain. Anteriorly in the front of the brain is the inferior frontal system, also known as Broca's area. And posteriorly, in red, is the parietal temporal system. And in yellow, is the occipital temporal system. And these are very much involved in reading, particularly in reading fluency. And what we originally found and has now been replicated by scientists across the world is that there is a neural signature for dyslexia. And that is inefficient posterior reading systems. What do I mean by that? Well, on the left, you see the reading systems in the front of the brain, Broca's area, and two systems in the back of the brain. In dyslexia, we see, in fact, increased activation in Broca's area in the front of the brain, but diminished activation in the two systems in the back of the brain, the occipital temporal, and the parietal temporal. And this finding in the back of the brain of the inefficient posterior reading systems is the neural signature for dyslexia. And in fact, similar neural systems exist in alphabetic languages. A colleague, uh, Araldo Palisu, reported that in English, French, and Italian students. This has then been replicated in German students. And um, closely, not exactly, but pretty closely in Chinese uh, students comparing typical and dyslexic readers. So what brain imaging has taught us about dyslexia is there is a neural signature for dyslexia, inefficient functioning of the neural systems for skilled and fluent reading, it's made visible a previously hidden disability. So as you can see, science has really marched forward. We know a great deal about dyslexia, that dyslexia is real, that it's highly prevalent, its impact occurs early, and the help, on the other hand, is often delayed. Now it is possible. What can we do? Now it is possible to identify at-risk status as early as kindergarten and first grade. Let me repeat that. What can we do? It is now possible to identify at-risk status as early as kindergarten and first grade. And, that, and now I want to talk about how we can do that. Um, it's a, it's a, a project that I've been uh, very involved in. It's, and the result of that project is the Shaywitz Dyslexia Screen. Let me tell you a little bit about it, particularly that it is evidence-based. The basis of this a measure. It's a study that I too have been involved in for quite a while, the Connecticut Longitudinal Study. And let me tell you a little bit why it's so important. There, at the time, and currently too, there's always the critical need for an epidemiologic longitudinal study of dyslexia. Most studies of dyslexia at the time were carried out in schools or clinics based on children who had already been diagnosed as dyslexia. What's the problem? Well, these studies and the results missed boys and girls who were not identified by their school and were referred to a clinic and therefore 
they weren't included in the studies. So this affected the results of studies uh, detailing prevalence or the ratio of boys to girls. And we weren't able to learn what happens to dyslexia over time. Does dyslexia ever go away, for example? So the study is 34 years and going strong. It has two major components, that of an epidemiologic sample survey. That means uh, working with a survey statistician, we selected uh, 12 towns in Connecticut, two schools in each town. And what we did was we enrolled them, we invited all of them to enroll in kindergarten in 1983. 445 children, which was over 90% of those eligible enrolled. The Connecticut Longitudinal Study is also a longitudinal cohort study, beginning at kindergarten entry, continuing through elementary, middle, and high school, college graduation for those who graduated, and for those who didn't graduate, we continue to follow them. So that cohort is now 39 years old, and in 2017, we continue to follow 345 of those students. And so the Connecticut Longitudinal Study has added important new dimensions um, to studies of dyslexia. Long-term outcome, beginning in kindergarten and following continuously through age 39. And so to repeat, there are two critical components. It's a sample survey and has a longitudinal design. So a sample survey means that we included unbiased populations so that they are both dyslexic and typical readers in the sample, and it allowed the Connecticut Longitudinal Study to address critical questions. The prevalence of dyslexia, the prognosis and outcome, and risk and protective factors. What are the measures we use? We use kindergarten child-based measures. Uh, we use teacher school-based measures. Um, two measures that we developed, one is called the Multigrade Inventory for Teachers, the MIT, MIT, and the End of Year Evaluation, EYE, and also a parent-based measure, the Yale Children's Inventory, the YCI. In particular, the Multigrade Inventory for Teachers, or the MIT, the MIT, was extremely helpful. It's teacher-based. And our goal was to obtain the teacher's perspective in a naturalistic setting. What were the teacher's observations? And we wanted to collect them in a systematic, consistent manner. Because remember, it's the teacher who works with the child day after day after day, who knows the, te the child's approach to learning to read better than anyone. It's efficient. The dyslexia, Shaywood's dyslexia screen requires five or 10 minutes, and it's reliable and valid. It has scales, including academic, language, dexterity, attention, activity, and behavior. And it allows us to have insight and have ratings of all overall academic and behavioral function so that the teacher provides a global impression of learning and behavior. And we can learn what the child's problems may have been from the teacher. Their, for example, their readiness for academic advance or lack of readiness. And what was the child's level of mastery of reading, decoding, and comprehension, mathematics, written language, and handwriting. So the important findings from the CLS, again, how prevalent it is, one in five children is dyslexic. That means every child has children with dyslexia. 
And it also gives us a caution. We look at low SI as school-identified prevalence rates, and we understand that schools often don't, are not energetic or eager to identify dyslexia and don't have a mechanism to do that. We learn that dyslexia affects both boys and girls, and we learn that the achievement gap between typical and dyslexic readers is evident as early as first grade. The achievement gap is evident as early as first grade. We also learn that over time, dyslexia doesn't go away. It's persistent, lifelong. And we also that learn that, as I mentioned a moment ago, dyslexia is universal. It affects all racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic groups. And to emphasize, because this is so important, and most people, parents, and educators often don't appreciate this, the achievement gap between typical readers and dyslexic readers is present and large in first grade. So when we saw that data, that information, we've had a passion and felt an urgent need to develop a screening instrument for young children. And we developed the Shaywitz Dyslexia Screen. We wanted to develop a fast, efficient screening measure to be able to identify children in kindergarten or first grade or second grade who might be at risk for dyslexia. It was designed to screen all kindergartens and first graders and second graders in a school. And the goal is to find children most at risk for dyslexia and target those children for extra help as early as possible. So the Shaywood's Dyslexia Screen is evidence-based. It's a brief assessment given to all children to identify the pool of children at risk for dyslexia. It's completed on a tablet, and the results are dichotomized into yes at risk or no, not at risk, and it has strong psychometrics. There exists screening using uh, different test batteries, a combination of phonemic awareness, reading fluency, oral vocabulary, and others. These tend to be elaborate and very time-consuming. And the problem is these test batteries, unfortunately, misidentified extremely high numbers of typical readers misidentified extremely high numbers of typical readers as dyslexic. So then people made attempts to reduce the number of false positives by adding yet another stage of evaluation. And this resulted in increasing the length of time for testing, but with minimal effects on prediction accuracy. So the Shaywitz Dyslexia Screen offers a new approach. Capture the person who knows the child's best insights that reflect the child's interaction with the teacher over time. So this is one source of screening information that has thus far been ignored, the teacher's insights about the child. Kindergarten, first, and second grade teachers have ample opportunity to observe their students over a substantial course, time course as they engage in relevant learning context. It's ideally suited to assess the early language and academic behaviors indicative of high risk for dyslexia in their students. So, the Shaywitz Dyslexia Screen is a new approach, captures teachers' insights, and remarkably, we found that teachers' response to a small subset of questions comprising in kindergarten 10 items, in first grade 12 items, in second grade 10 items, 
predict children at risk for dyslexia with a high degree of accuracy. Again, to reiterate, the Shaywood's dyslexia screen engages teachers, captures his or her insights. It's extremely efficient, takes five to 10 minutes to complete, inexpensive, completed by the teacher who knows the child, has very good sensitivity, predicting accurately the children who have, who are at risk of dyslexia, and specificity, predicting with a pretty high degree of accuracy the children who do, are not at risk for dyslexia. It's based on longitudinal data, and again, it's evidence-based. And this is a very, very important point that I'm about to make. Please keep in mind that when reading growth has been charted and measured over time, it's maximal for the first few years of school then it plateaus. So reading growth is maximal the first few years of school and then plateaus. So if you want to be able to influence that fast rise of reading when it occurs early on. And now we have new data in a, uh, published in the Journal of Pediatrics in November 2015 that the reading gap between typical and dyslexic readers is already present in first grade and persists. The achievement gap in reading is present as early as first grade and persists through adolescence. So the reading development over time, there are large differences between dyslexic and typical readers already present in first grade and over time, the trajectories of dyslexic readers never converge with those of typical readers. And here, on this graph, you can see in a very powerful way that the achievement gap between typical and dyslexic readers occurs as early as first grade. On top, in the orange color, a typical reader's trajectory and reading is on the y-axis, grade in school on the x-axis, and you can see dyslexic readers in blue. And you can see that gap, it's already present in first grade, it's large, and as you look across, it's persistent. So to reiterate, there are large differences between dyslexic and typical readers already present in first grade, over time, as I said a moment ago, the trajectories of dyslexic readers never converge with those of typical readers. This provides strong evidence and an impetus, a powerful imp impetus, I would say, for early screening if we are to close the achievement gap. Although the gap may not become wider over time, it, pers it persists. Intervention in later grades may decrease or prevent the gap from widening, but will not overcome the already existing differences in early grades. So the Shaywood's dyslexia screen is teacher completed early at the end of kindergarten or first grade or second grade. The uh, kindergarten has 10 items first grade 12 items, second grade 10 items. It's quick and it's inexpensive and has strong evidence that it's reliable, it's valid, it's sensitive and specific. So what it is physically, the, the items are in a rating scale and the teacher circles a number from one through six for each item. It's totally digital and automatic. The items, for example, within the academic scale might be associate sound with letter correctly. And, and you would have six choices of which most correctly aligns with what the teacher has perceived in the child. Uh, teachers asked about the overall reading level. Compared to other students in the same grade, what is the student's skill level 
in the area of, for example, decoding and other areas are asked about as well. And here you can see the classification accuracy of our, uh, Shaywood's dyslexia screen in both the national clinical study and in the Connecticut study. And they generally range between, uh, between point, somewhere in the 0.7 to 0.88 range, which is very good. And so let me talk for a moment. Well, what happens if you don't do this? If you fail to screen for and diagnose dyslexia? Well, I can tell you from studies and from decades of my own personal experience, the cost is very high. If a student, a child, is not identified, they don't know what they have, they don't receive evidence-based instruction, they continue to struggle, they see themselves as a failure, and they think they're not smart. So again, they don't have any knowledge of what his or her difficulty is that has a name, and wow, does that promote anxiety and the lack of self-awareness of why can't I do what everyone around me can do. As a result, for example, if children are asked to read aloud and stumble, they're bullied, they're teased to the point that they'd rather be sent to the principal's office for misbehavior than read aloud in class. And they see themselves as not meant for school. Very often they dropped out. And within the dyslexia population, that particularly who hasn't been identified, there's a high prevalence of prison, addiction, and self-harm. For example, being half as likely to go to college, significantly higher unemployment, and lower uh, uh, lifetime earnings. In our own study, when we examined our population at in their 20s, early 20s, we found that the dyslexic students were half as likely as controls to have any education past high school, 45% compared to 23%. Unemployment was three times as high, and the likelihood of becoming teen or young parents was four times as common in dyslexic men and three times as common in dyslexic women. And here you can see the high school dropout when we compared typical and dyslexic readers was three times as high in dyslexic readers. So the Shaywood's dyslexia screen, it's easily and efficiently administered to individuals or groups to look for at risk for dyslexia. It's efficient, reliable, and a, a user-friendly dyslexia tool for K-2 students who may be at risk for dyslexia. It's based on teacher, the one who knows the child best, observations. And it emphasized phonological, linguistic, and academic performance. This is done all in just a couple of minutes per student as opposed to other measures which take up precious instructional time. So that the features and benefits of the Shaywood's dyslexia screen is that it is quickly and easily administered and identifies dyslexic, dyslexia risk. It's developed specifically for younger students. The administration takes less than five minutes per student. It allows the screening of individuals or groups. It's easy to use. It's teacher-friendly. There's digital administration, scoring, and reporting via, via either Q Global or via the universal screening application at Pearson. So I ask you, as someone who has dedicated her professional life to understanding dyslexia and 
advocating for children and adults who are dyslexic. So I ask each of you who is viewing this to please join us in closing the achievement gap by early screening, early identification, and intervention for dyslexia. I invite you to go on to our website, uh, dyslexia.yale.edu. You can follow uh, our center, the Yale Center for Dyslexia and Creativity, at Dyslexia Yale on Twitter or on Facebook. I also want to point out that the materials you've seen are copywritten and may not be reproduced, copied in whole, or in part under any conditions. Thank you very much for your attention.